Hey everybody, Dana Stovern here with the Magic of Somatic Money, back for part th part three of how somatic money came into being. And this is the long version. So if you haven't seen the first two parts, I really encourage you to go back and uh, watch and listen to those. So that whole thing being about like, how did body-based money relationship come into being for me? How did how did that happen? Because this kind of this sets the stage then for this very um, disturbing and traumatic event that that happened in my life. By now, I had met my second husband. We were not married, so I had met Bob. I met him in Durango. We had moved out to a cabin uh, southeast of Durango. We were living in a cabin overlooking the Animus River Valley with the La Plata's behind us, like really, really beautiful living. And I was working on building my business. Yes, I was struggling with it, but I, but I was doing it. And we decided that we were going to try for a family. Um, it was our last shot to be able to do that because I was nearing for the age of 40 and so uh, the, the clock was ticking and so we started trying to have a family and I did get pregnant I got pregnant in the I believe it was September of 2010 it was an emotionally challenging pregnancy for me I was because of the background like I spoke a little bit about my family but um, because of the background that I have with my mother, I was really afraid to tell her about this. I did, we did not tell her until I had cleared through my first trimester. Um, and I, what I know now that I did not know then is that by being pregnant with my son, he was, his presence, his physicality and his energy in my body was naturally beginning to displace a lot of the deep-rooted trauma that had been sitting in my body that I didn't understand was there. So up to that point, I had done a lot of awareness work and healing work concerning the dysfunction in my family, and I knew it in a general nature, but I did not know the secrets. Truly, I did not know the secrets that were embedded in my family. And so when I got pregnant with Kenyon, he naturally began to displace that and I began having experiences of things coming up through and out of my body. Now those are very private experiences. I, I do need to share those stories at, the, at some point but they're not um, for, for, the for, for the nature of this telling. But I, just suffice it to say that he was displacing energetics and emotional and physical stuff out of my body so he could make space for himself and as he did that I was experiencing trauma coming out of my body as I was pregnant with him and um, second trimester um, was doing okay physically was having some really deep issues emotionally didn't really have anybody to talk about that with. I didn't really understand what was going on. Some of the energetic stuff that I was experiencing, a psychic being pregnant with trauma, um, there was a lot that was going on there. And I, I still don't know a therapist today that would be able to handle the kind of stories that I would need to be able to tell, to talk, to talk about that. Anyway, suffice it to say, it was very intense. It was, um, at some points, it was traumatic being pregnant and um, very much did want the pregnancy, very much did want to have a son. And um, I arrived into, it was the end of the, it was end of the, the second trimester. We were right around week 25, week 26. And I began to experience proclampsia did not know it. It was between doctor's appointments. And long story short is that um, early one morning, um, Bob got me out of bed because I was having, I was shaking, I was having seizures. He got me to the hospital and my blood pressure topped out at 275 over 175. And they took me into surgery for, um, an emergency c-section to deliver Kenyon and he was not quite old enough for his heart to take 
So while they rushed me into intensive care to get my body and my blood pressure stabilized, they also went to work on Kenyon to get his heartbeat to take. Um, they called on and a flight for life helicopter was coming in from Denver from Children's Hospital. Um, but they had that helicopter turn around because uh, Kenyon did not make it. They, they, they tried and tried and tried and Kenyon's heart um, just would not sustain a, sustain a heartbeat. So um, we lost our son, we lost a chance of having a family, and I was on life support for 36 hours and they did not know if I was going to make it or not. And after 36 hours from, I guess, you know, what the doctors were able to tell, they, they decided to go ahead and begin to pull me off of life support. And I, I was able to uh, come into con consciousness and um, sust sustain being here. And the crazy thing is, is they, they put me through a CAT scan. And with that level of um, blood pressure and seizing that I had had, and I know I know I did not seize just once. I, I must have seized a half a dozen times between what happened that night and Bob finally getting me into the truck and getting me to the hospital. It is amazing that I'm alive. Um, when they put me through the CAT scan, they did not find anything blown like I I, I, I should I, sh I could easily have had a heart attack or a stroke or an aneurysm and none of that happened I had I did not blow any of my you know vein veins or arteries so, so to speak I was I came back intact physically intact mentally and emotionally and energetically was a whole was a whole other story and so um, Yes, I'm a miracle, and it is a miracle that I came back to be able to do what I've done and continue to do what I am doing now. I, I really am kind of a walking miracle at this point on many different accounts. And so I began my recovery. I came, I came back and began my recovery, uh, physically, physically recovering, mentally recovering, emotionally recovering, and physically recovering. But it... Um, it took a long time, and there's many different stories, in, ins and outs with all of this, and, and basically the bottom line is that I thought I hit rock bottom when my son died and, and we lost him, but that event started my life continuing to unravel for the next 18 months. So by the time I, so this was 2010, so by the time I got to the um, spring, summer of 2011, like I was physically broken, I was mentally broken, I was emotionally broken, I was spiritually broken, like I was just, I was a broken person trying to do the best that I could do to recover and get back into my business and trying the, trying the best that I could. But Long story short, I like I hit um, financial along with all of this. I hit financial rock bottom with all of this. I was barely able to sustain um, appointments on the calendar, and um, my my money was my, my money was really taking a hit. Like I make a joke, like about that point in my life that I was so broke that I didn't even have money to file for bankruptcy. Like I looked at what it would like what it would take to file for bankruptcy, but it took it takes money to file for bankruptcy, and I didn't have any money. So like there was this whole thing about like you know wow this is a crapshoot at this point, and so I headed into the fall battling with credit card companies and not knowing how to keep my business going and in a severe amount of grief. Now you gotta understand, like Kenyon had shifted all this stuff in my body and then like when he left my body, there was all of all of this ha stuff happening in my body not only physically but mentally emotionally and energetically like like what i said before kenyon dislodged age old i think past lifetime familial lineage and this lifetime the trauma that had been sitting in my body and so when he left my body 
not only was I grieving him and struggling with my business and dealing with bad finances, I was also coming to terms with the secrets in my family that were coming out of my body. So in the middle of all of this, I was coming to terms with beginning to realize that I am a survivor of infant incest. I am, a, and not just, and that's not in a vacuum because it came down the family line from my mom and from her dad, my, my grandfather. And that's when I began, see, we, we began having so much more going on with the internet and communication and therapies coming along. And that's when I began to put two and two together with words like trauma and dissociation and toxic and uh, narcissistic personality disorder and oh there's this thing of incest and like I like I be finally began to get all the words that I had been missing for 15 years when I began my healing journey not even knowing knowing it was a healing journey with the self self-help stuff and going to therapy um, you know, many years before when I lost Kenyon and all of that stuff came out of my body and was symptomatic and I'm a psychic and I was seeing flashes and I was getting messages and I was getting crazy mediumship from my family energetically on the other side of the veil telling me things about my own personal trauma. Like it is amazing. I survived that landscape coming out of coming out of that whole thing. So this is where, you know, I fully embrace and know my gift, psychic empath channel, healer, all of that. I'm fully embraced with that gift. And now I used my gift to get to the bottom of why I had this severe onset of proclampsia, why did Kenyon leave my body, what was this all about, what am, what am I to learn, things don't happen in a vacuum, all of this stuff was coming out of my body and I was working with spirit world on it. It was hard, it was heart-wrenching, it was intense, it is amazing I got through that post Kenyon landscape with my life. Like, it's amazing. It's a miracle that I lived through the, the trauma of, of losing him and the blood pressure and the seizing. It's amazing that I survived that. But it is also equally amazing that I survived and came through all of the post-traumatic stuff that was coming out of my body that I was experiencing very psychically and working with spirit team on that and learning some real awful awful truths about my family that no one has ever recognized no one has ever talked about and it's helped me understand why i've had such a difficult time functioning in 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 this lifetime so that was that whole landscape through um 2010 into 2011 so we get to I get to the autumn of 2011 and man I'm just barely making it people don't know it because like when you're a coach you, you like you gotta <laughs> people don't want to hear about your shit when you're a coach <laughs> like and, and when you're doing session work you are holding that space for other people it is not about you and so I'm barely holding it together to be able to do that. Talk about Chiron wounded healer. And I'm barely holding it together with my finances and I'm barely holding it together coming through this post-traumatic healing experiences that I'm going through. And it's the fall of 2011 and um, not too many people knew what was really truly going on behind the scenes, but a very close friend at the time, uh, Mary Alice, she knew I was going through some stuff. She didn't know how bad it was because I hadn't let on. She didn't know how bad it was, but she knew it was bad. And in the middle of going through all of this, out of the kindness of her heart, she said, Hey, Dana, I'm going to Pagosa Springs, Colorado to go do a um, water yoga class at the Hot Springs. I've got this hotel room. Why don't you take a break? Why don't you come on over, stay at the hotel, 
um, we'll soak in the pools, and it's it basically, you know, why don't why don't you take a load off? And that was one of the beautiful things about living in Durango. Oh my God, you know, the access into the desert, the access into the mountains, you know, the the hiking and the biking and the trails, and then just down the road, Pagosa Springs, the hot springs. And so, at that point in my life, I was really making use of those hot springs because they really truly were and are were in our healing. Well. What Mary Alice didn't know is that I was so broke, I barely had enough money for fuel. I literally like was counting out change to pay to get fuel to get to Pagosa Springs and have a little bit of a meal and and come back from that. And on my way to Pagosa Springs, I like I had a panic attack. Like I got in the middle of those hills and hollers. I'm driving along and I. I had somewhat of a panic attack and pulled over the side of the road and I nearly turned around. I almost turned around, but something said to me, it's like, no, no, you just, you just got to get there. You just got to get there. And, um, I did get there and I went to the front desk and they gave me the room key and I got into the room and I opened up the room and, um, Mary Alice, God bless her. She had set up this entire room in this beautiful, like she had crystals up and tarot and unlit candles and aromatherapy. Like I stepped into, I thought of stepping into a hotel room, I stepped into a sanctuary. And it was the first time, like I was away from my husband and I didn't have to keep up pretenses, like we're, you know, we're making good to get along here. I, like I could let that go and I wasn't in community, so I could let that go and I walked into this room and the sanctuary space was going on and I just, I erupted because I like, I let go, I surrendered, I didn't have to keep up appearances. And I just, I stood there and started crying out of relief, out of just the sensation of letting go. And closed the door, dropped the bag. It was just kind of in that space. And, you know, she's, she left me a note. She's over at water yoga doing, doing her thing. And, um, and so I had a little while, I had a little while to be with by myself and get gathered by myself. And I, um, crashed on the bed, you know, I dropped my bags, crashed on the bed and I just kind of let myself erupt and that all kind of passed. And after, as it passed, um, I felt energetic light come up in the room. I felt energetic light come up in the room and I began to tune in and it was none other than Sananda, you know, G Jesus, Yeshua. And so of course I'm like, I get up and I sit up in bed and I can't believe I'm having this extraordinary conversation with with Sananda and, and mind you, like my background, yes, I grew up Methodist. I, I left the Methodist church, deconstructed out of Methodism like a very long, very, very long time ago. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a witch, I'm a psychic, I'm a shaman at that point in um, the heart of the South, heart of the Southwest. And so, you know, Sananda showing up like that was, he had shown up for me a couple times before. There were some other instances where he had shown up but not like this, like he showed up in like this full array of, of bright purification light. And it wasn't even talking, we were having this energetic exchange and I could feel myself feeling better. And mentally my human stuff was like, Dana, Dana, you're talking with Jesus, so make sure you remember everything. <laughs> remember everything he's telling you. <laughs> And I don't know how long this went on, but it went on for a little while. And then I could feel the conversation, the exchange, it, um, the dial began to get turned down. It completely, the dial began to get turned down and he just, he faded. And I was back in that hotel room again by myself, but I felt better. I felt different. Now, a lot of the people in the Durango spiritual community, once I had gone through my experience, they're, they're like, once I came back into consciousness and I was beginning to interact with community, everybody was like, oh my God, Dana, something, something is different about you. And I, frankly, I had had some kind of near death experience and a lot of them had asked, you know, did you see the light? Did you go off to the light? Did you come back from light? Like there were no, there was no light. There was no tunnels. I didn't remember anything. The only thing that I was able to figure out, Mary Alice, like th this got to be a little bit crazy. So finally one day Mary, Mary Alice and I got together in an afternoon cup of tea. We sat down, we're like, okay, we're going to meditate and we're going to figure out where did Dana go while she was on life support. And 
um, the nearest, nearest I can figure, because both Mary and Alice and I, we kept getting this thing about like blue, like these big blue beings, and it was like this wah, 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 big blue beings, and all of a sudden it like hit both of us at the same time. It's like, <gasps> I was with the whales. I was in the water with these great, big, beautiful blue, blue whales, and that's where I was held while I was in life support. And I, I remember visiting that place and being with these in the water, deep in the water with these blue whales and they're talking with all their sonic sounds. And I remember knowing that I was in a place where I could make a choice as far as whether to go ahead and cross over or come back. So no, I didn't see the light. I believe I was held in a, uh, a holding zone so I could make a choice. And that's what I did. And um, the choice that I made was was to was to come back. And I in that meditation with Mary Alice, I remember being very clear in that holding zone that I decided to come back and I decided to come back to do the work that I had initially set out to do on the planet. Um, so fast forward then, uh, year and a half, 18 months later, year and a half later, and there I had had this um, healing with Sananda, and I was, I'm in that, I'm in that hotel room gathering myself, and I'm, I'm finally like, whatever Sananda did for me in through that conversation, that exchange, he did a healing for me. He did a healing for me that that no one else could, and I came through that exchange with him, and I felt put back together, like I guess that would be the way to, more put back together, more at peace, more cohesive, more healed, more in my body. And um, so that's, that's, what, that's what happened. And I'm thinking, whew, great, you know, good call on Mary Alice's part. I came over, the healing has happened, we're good. And like so many of my healing experience, there's usually a part one, a part two, a part like there's all these different parts. And so, no, um, Sananda, the visit from Sananda set the stage. And then I could feel like once I kind of had my bearings again, and mind you, like I have tried many times to go back and try and remember what Sananda told me. And I, they wiped my data banks. Like I can't remember a thing. I can remember the sensations, but I cannot remember mentally um, what that exchange was about. So anyway, he dissipated out of the room and I had a little time to gather myself. And then I could, I felt that the room tip with energy and all of a sudden I realized, wow, I'm not alone. Like Sananda left, but this room is filled, filled with spirit. I, I could feel them. And in that place as I'm there, I heard, I heard a voice say, call in your spirit money guide now i mean it was booming it boomed i um audibly physically heard it it was a male voice and it was like and, and when it spoke it was like wah 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 like call in your like it was very dramatic it was very dramatic <laughs> And the moment I heard that call in your spirit money guide now, I had like several different reactions. The first reaction I had was, <gasps> I have a spirit money guide? Like that was a new thought. That was a new, nobody, nobody in the spiritual community. We talk about spirit guides, we talk about angels, ascended best. Nobody had ever talked to me about a spirit a money guide. And the second reaction I had was like, <gasps> isn't that taboo? Or what? Are we allowed? Are, are we allowed to have a money, a money guy, a spirit money guy? Are, like, like that doesn't break any rules with God or anything. <laughs> so I had those two reactions going on. But, you know, given the nature of who I am and where I was at in the situation, when spirit asks me to do something, like nine, nine times out of ten, I'll be like, oh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. <laughs> let's go. So I immediately got into lotus position on the bed, got all set up, hands open, breathe in, breathe out, and very audibly, very loudly, I said, I call in my spirit money guide now, and nothing, crickets. You gotta understand that when spirit world asks me to do something and I do the whole calling in and all, all of this stuff, 
things happen. I can feel the energies. I can see stuff. I can like, it happens. I called in my spirit money guide and I heard, yeah, it was like crickets. And that was my first telltale sign of like, wow, they had me call in my spirit money guide and my spirit money guide didn't show up. I am fucked. <laughs> like at that point I understood why I had had such a difficult time, challenging time with money on planet earth because if my spirit team told me to call in a spirit money guide and no spirit money guide showed up like that just told me right there like you know no wonder my money doesn't ever feel like it really works and no wonder money doesn't make sense to me and you know no wonder no wonder no wonder like i had all of these epiphanies going and as that's going on and i'm feeling like okay i called in my spirit money team my spirit money guide and he didn't and didn't show up like now what am i supposed to do and i'm right about the time i started going now what am i supposed to do i felt on my right side this vortex open i mean this is like this is like science fiction kind of stuff it's like vortex open yes i was physically sitting on the bed but i felt my self energetically leave my body and go down a tunnel and I felt angelic realm like there were there had to have been two three four five half a dozen angels angels were with me we went down this vortex tunnel and I literally felt myself drawn through and land in a past lifetime of mine it was it was very much like you know that you know that story the Christmas Carol and Scrooge and where where you know um, Christmas past Christmas present Christmas future shows up and takes Scrooge on all of these excursions to see all these different things it felt like that it was like that I had these angels with me and before I knew it we were like whew, down that tunnel in an, in another past lifetime past lifetime that I knew I was existing in and it had to have been something like I don't think it was old Europe it was definitely felt M Middle East, like I want to say Egypt or Tunisia or like that Meso that old Mesopotamia area. It was, it was like it, old, old, old place. And I got dumped out the end of the tunnel. I landed in this lifetime and I was kind of like hovering in a room over who I was in that lifetime and the angels were there. And, and it was a really bad lifetime. It was like, what I was shown was like, I was practicing my gift, my psychic gift under duress, under threat with little to no money. I was in a hostage situation. Like it was, it was bad and it was dark and it was nasty and it was scary. And it was like, if I practice my gift, I, it was threat of death. But if I didn't practice my gift, it was threat of death. And there was no money. Like, like it was like n no winning period. And and spirit world, my angels, they're with me. They're, they're like, Dana, that lifetime is playing out in the lifetime you're in right now. Like, that's why when you are doing your gift and you feel like um, you can't, you, you know, you want to charge for money, but you can't charge for money. And there's this feeling of like, you might get killed over the money for the, re like, it was this really convoluted, awful, ugly thing. And my angels were basically saying, you know, that, th that thing you see happening in this past lifetime that is playing out in your current modern day lifetime. And they asked me, they said, do you want to do it anymore? And I'm like, hell no, hell no, I don't want to do that anymore. And they're like, okay. And the next thing I knew then they started telling me and showing me all these different energetic things to do, things to say, energetic energies to run. I, you know, at this point I don't remember what they are now I need to go back to my journal and take a look at the specifics and basically my angels were helping me run and do healing work coding work coding work through my DNA cellular coding in my body and the feeling the sensations that I had was that the energetic coding from that past lifetime that had transferred into this past transferred into this lifetime the angels were helping to show me how to change the coding in my body to let go of that past lifetime and heal my body into better time better space this lifetime right so we we did that and i'm still in that room in the past lifetime and we did we did that energy work and 
I begin to feel a little bit better. I'm like, oh my God. And then the energy, it kind of cleaned up and the inner, the angels, it's kind of like they scooped me up or something and just came back through the, the vortex tunnel. I'm like, wow. Like I came, collected myself back into my body. And I'm like, all right, nobody's gonna believe this. This is kind of crazy, but it's like, it was really real. It was really real and true. And then I'm collecting myself. And once again, I hear, call in your spirit money guide now. <laughs> Heard that for a second time. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's try it again. So I sat there, lotus position, called in my spirit money guide again nothing crickets nothing no spirit money guide and I was just like dunk oh my god I, I really it was at that feeling of like we did all that and still no spirit money guide and again a feeling of like wow I'm really I'm really screwed over with my money this lifetime <laughs> well that all happened the pause happened angelic realm came back again vortex opened up on the right side again <laughs> went through the tunnel um, did three shaman journeys, did three full shaman journeys back to different lifetimes. One time I swear to God, it was like Oracle at Delphi or something. I, each one of these was a psychic lifetime where I had been misused, abused, overlooked, hostage, threat of death, little to the money. I mean, really, really, really awful stuff. And now what I know about the witch hunts that had happened in Europe, the taboo nature of psychic women, even during biblical time, um, it makes a whole lot of sense to me now that I lived out those lifetimes at that point and they're still happening this lifetime. So the research and reading that I've done since then, it all lines up. It's like, oh, well, that, that makes a whole lot of sense why I'm carrying around all of that unfinished baggage and business. Um, well, anyway, so three shaman journeys, three different lifetimes, Angels each time showed me the lifetime. Do you want to continue to do this day? Always ask me, always ask me. We're, we live on a planet of free will. So they asked me, do you want to continue? You know, do you want to continue to do this this lifetime? Answer was always hell no. <laughs> they would show me different things. We do them. I could feel the energetic shift in my body with cellular coding, um, change in money coding, business coding. Come back down the tunnel. Again, call in your spirit money guide, call them in, <sighs> nothing. All right. So I come back from that third shaman journey and um, and I should probably also say at this point, like my, my ex had my second ex, ex husband, Bob, like when I tell stories like this, Bob would always intercede and go, and just so you know, um, I'm the one that took all the drugs growing up. Dana has taken absolutely nothing. She like, she, this, this, this is a drug free zone. <laughs> So that's what I want to, I should probably tell that all this, all this traveling, meeting with people, meeting with spirit, traveling, all this, this is, it, it's completely clean, like no drugs, no alcohol, completely clean, you know, no mushrooms, like none, none of that. This is, this is all, yeah, ayahuasca free, mushroom free, alcohol free, um, LSD, like all, like no drugs, like uh, com completely clean journeys. So I come back from that third journey. And I'm feeling pretty exhausted at this point. Like I, I have been like, I've done a lot of boot, like spiritual boot camps in my life. Nothing compared to what I did that night. And no, Mar no Mary Alice. Like Mary Alice is all like, do 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 do. She's still doing water yoga, water yoga thing. Like this was set up perfectly. Come back from that third um, journey, and the spirit world again calling your spirit money guide down and I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get in lotus position and I'm like, cause I'm not at this point, I'm not believing anything's going to happen. So kind of half heartedly I go, okay, I call in my spirit money guide now. And I'm just, I'm waiting for like crickets again. I'm just like, whatever. And it was like, ding, you called. <laughs> and this, beautiful spirit money guide he dropped into space he was like 1940s um business bookkeeper accounting kind of guy he was just a little bit shorter than i am 
and he had on a three-piece tweed suit with the pocket watch, the chain, the pocket watch across the front and the, and the pocket watch in the pocket. And he had on wire rim spectacles and there was an abacus hanging in the air and there was a pen and an inkwell and the ledgers, like it was all old school, all of that. Like my spirit money guide, he came in, ding, um, materialized, like almost like physically he was there and he showed up. And the thing that at that first meeting that I remember from him was how much love, compassion, unconditional love he had and has for me with my money and my numbers. And it was the very first time in my life that it was okay to be with your money and have love in the air and acceptance in the air and unconditional love in the air and compassion and empathy. And he was the first being who seeded with me a sense that numbers can vibrate intelligently with love. And I felt such a sense of acceptance and healing that no matter all of the bad financial decisions that I've made or you know, thought that I'd made financially or all of the awful financial things that have happened or all of the things that I didn't understand about money, the spirit money guide, he, he forgave me. Like he didn't even say a word, but there was a feeling of forgiveness of like, no worries there's no shame here there's no blame here i just i'm holding a compassionate financial container with you and it was so lovely and such a relief and so beautiful and there was a i had this feeling of like oh my god i had to cut through all that crap of those awful past lifetimes and do all of that healing just so a spirit money guide could show up just so the blocks, all the blocks that I've been carrying around to not receive financial help, you know, physically, energetically, emotionally, spiritually, um, all the blocks I've been carrying around, it's like those had been dissolved, dissolved enough so that when I called him my spirit money guide, he could show up. And that's what I, this is where I want to pause and say to all of you that yes, I am special for who I am in my lifetime, in my walk. And so are you. You are very special for who you are in your lifetime, your path, your journey, your walk. And I can call on a spirit money guide. And if I can call on a spirit money guide and have him show up or her show up or they show up, so can you. You in your lifetime, if you're sitting here watching this going, oh, that's really special for her. I wish that could be for me. And like, like and I can't spit it out fast enough. It totally is for you and is now for you and it is is yours so right now i want you to call in your spirit money guide or your spirit money guides or your spirit money team i've got a lot of names or your divine financial light team or your money angels like there's so many of them and there's so many of them here to work with us and for us on this money stuff there is no separation between you and the money and the spiritual world like for so long money and business has been in one area spirituality and god has been in another area they have not been allowed to touch and now we get to let them touch and so i am here to tell you right now today please call on your spirit money guide to come in and love up on you with your money and your numbers and give you healing and give you love and give you that unconditional compassionate space for your money to do better. And most of all, this is to let you know, you are not alone with your money. In the toxic financial patriarchy in the 3D world of survivalism, we get told you've got to go do off and do your money on your own. You have to teach yourself on your own. We're not going to show you. Go figure it out yourself. That's the, cult the financial culture we live in and it is bullshit. And so what I want you to know is first, you are not alone. You have help and that help is voluminous help from spirit world and if you call them in and ask them to be there they will begin to come in and support you and help you and guide you and that's what began to happen for me as i left that very spiritual experience in that beautiful hotel room that mary alice had set up and that you know the crazy thing that night was that i finished that experience and i was ravenous 
like I was hungry at that point, so I was ravenous. So I left the hotel room and went and got dinner. And as I'm at dinner, I was madly trying to journal everything, trying to remember everything. And I got back to the hotel room, and I wasn't even like back in the hotel room ten minutes, and Mary Alice showed up. So this whole thing was incredibly orchestrated by Spirit World. Like there was no accident. This was supposed to happen. This was, this was like I believe it was. Preordained along my along along my path. Like since the preclampsia and the high blood pressure didn't kill me off, they gave me this. <laughs> so that evening, then you know, Mary Alice come comes back in, like la 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 la, yoga this, yoga that. She's told me all these wonderful stories, and then she starts to notice that I'm kind of quiet. She's like, so what happened? You know, what'd you do? What happened to you? And I'm and I, for a moment, I thought, oh my God, should I? Should I tell tell? And I was like, of, of course I have to tell her. So so I told her. You know, I started I started to I like, well, I had quite an experience while you were gone. And so we just we immediately like, she got a little bit to eat, and we immediately put on our bathing suits. And we decided the best thing to do is get our bathing suits on, go back across、um, the road, and、um, you know, flip flop back over. <laughs> And、um, go go back across the road and go soak in the Pagoda Hot Springs. So it was like open till midnight. So we did one of those like、um, 10 o'clock stars in the sky, and they got the twinkly lights at the pool, and not very many people are there. And we got a whole pool to ourselves, and I got to unwind this whole telling and tale, and I got to tell Mary Alice what happened with this whole thing in those beautiful. Healing waters, those pools of Pagosa Hot Springs that are connected into Kuan Yin and a sister city on the other side of the world. I believe it's in China. Like it was, it was this, it was this whole thing that happened that was really quite beautiful. And without a shadow of a doubt, as that evening closed out, and I was able to get myself back home, and I told、um, Bob at the time, I told Bob a little bit about my experience and. Um, you know, both of us being in recovery from the trauma that we've been through,、um, and he was building. Get a load of this. He was building a Buckminster Fuller bamboo dome. Like that was his healing. <laughs>、um, got home, and then from there on out, I began to make it a habit. Every morning, get my cup of tea. Every morning, I'd get up, get my cup of tea, go out onto the deck, and I would sit down and I would call in my spirit money guide, and we would meditate together. He would show up, and he would tell me very specific things, like if I needed to do an energy healing thing, or if I needed to do a financial thing, or if I needed to do an energy financial healing thing, or if I needed to do like any any number of things. Like he started giving me. Direction, tips, tools, and I started heading off and doing this on my own. And I thought, I thought, this was just for me.、Um, I should also probably say at this point that as I came away from the experience, I left with that whole experience. I left with the impression, the impression of, oh, money code is embedded in our DNA in our body. Let me say that again. Money code is embedded in our body, in our DNA, in our cellular coding. If I got anything from that entire evening, one was we're not alone, spirit money guide, and two, it's happening in our body. So all of you should be going ding. That's where the connection, the synapse happened between mind, body, spirit of physical money here. Energetics of money here, spirituality of money here, integrated in the body vibrationally in in code, and that is eventually, essentially, what what I have developed out over a period of time is what is the money coding happening in your body, vibrating at any given minute with your finances. But.、Um, What began happening from there is I was meditating every single day with my spirit money guide and getting direction from him and thinking, oh, this is just about me. This is just about me and my business. <laughs> I was so wrong. <laughs> spirit World started bringing people to my front door to do sessions, and we would get into the sessions and. I would begin to find out, oh, what they're unfolding in front of me. They were they started telling me these very personal, private, financial issues or dramas that were that were going on. And when this was happening, Spirit World 
started elbowing, I could feel them nudge, 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 like, tell your story, Dana, tell your story. And my, my brain talk with them was like, that story's kind of crazy. Like, Bob knows a little bit, Mary Alice knows, nobody else knows. Well, we're just going to leave it like that, <laughs> right? And Sparrow will go, tell them your story, nudge, nudge, elbow, 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 tell them your story. And so I started telling people this story about these experiences that, you know, I was going through financially and, and then the spiritual experience and that as these people started showing up on my doorstep, I was noticing, like, I, I literally was going from, I think I was like $300 in my bank account, $300 and it growing up to a thousand and being able to begin to um, meet my business obligations. And the next thing I know, like I'm in sus sustainability, like it didn't, like it was, after that spiritual experience, it was probably two, three, like by two to four, two to four months, I was fully sustainable. And then from that sustainability, I was growing it out from there. And so just the spiritual experience alone healed me enough to give me stability for the money to begin to work so much better and the business to begin to work so much better. And then people showing up on my doorstep needing help. And I start telling the story. And I tell, and just in telling the story, like I would tell the story to them and they would get really quiet and sit there and listen to it. And that would be the session. They'd be like, a, a, you know, a handful of them, they'd listen to it and they go, okay, what you told me, that gave me enough for me to go ahead and go do what I need to go do. And, and I'd be like, really? Just telling you that story? Like, they're like, yeah, that's a pretty healing story, Dana. And you know, in meeting with them in subsequent sessions, we began to see that the story and the tools that like they would take an idea or a tool from the story and apply it into their money and their money began to work better. And that's when I was like, oh, this is not just for me. This is a universal. Like I can't hoard that experience, that experiential knowledge for myself. I need to begin to share it. And so that's when I very consciously began to take that next step into beginning to share my story, work with clients. And that's when at a very rudimentary level, we, we, we were doing things like, is that a t like, there's the story, but where are the tools and where's the energy? That, that's where we began to kind of peel the layers back on this thing to figure out what were we dealing with here and what did people need? and. And I was, at that point, I was very honed in on doing soul retrievals and shamanism. It was basically financial shamanism, financial soul retrieval. And I remember one woman, she was a professor down in Arizona and she'd been through some financial hard times and she was having to put her house on the market there and she didn't want to, it was like in foreclosure. And we used this toolage and not only brought the house out of foreclosure, but she sold the house out of, out of profit and was able to save a good chunk of money for her retirement. When we did, when I did that work with that woman and we saw that happen, that was when I was like, this could really help people boots on the ground, grassroots people. And I have so many stories like that along those lines. Like I need to begin to tell, tell those stories here. And so, I need to go ahead and close out this part of the video. And that's when I began to launch what I called, um, I called it money magic. I moved from purple Phoenix psychic reader and then I had become um, intuitive coach uh, psychic reader with the purple Phoenix. And then now, then I relaunched again, I started doing something that I called money magic. And I started openly telling my story at events I think I had some recordings, like it was very rudimentary, but I started being open about my experience and sharing it and beginning to give some of the toolage to people and more people began showing up. And that's where I began to do that thing where I would do a session, try and meet people where they were at, share with them what I already knew. We would go into sessions, spirit world would channel and give us more. Literally, I'm doing many mediumship of spirit world saying, okay, with that person and with what you know, this is what you need to do. And so we would cultivate more energy information on it. And I basically been collect data, collect data, collect data, plug it into session, collect data, plug it into session. Um, 12 years of that, just building out the platform 
that I now have with somatic money. So everything with somatic money that you now see in my book, in the Oracle deck, in the recordings, in the blueprints, all of that is tried and true. All of that has been, has come through session. People have used it. People have gotten benefit, had improvements with your, with their money. None of this is like, it's been pulled out of thin air from spirit world and then plugged into experiential work. And this is the stuff that has helped people save people, kept them afloat, helped them keep their financial sanity, getting, getting them to a better space. And so that's what I have been doing ever since that inception. And I have bucked a trend of spiritual community many people in the spiritual community think this is taboo to to pair up money work with spirituality and so that causes friction and then when I go into the business community it's oh you're bringing woo into money and business oh that's taboo we can't do that so I am I am breaking rules I am breaking cultural rules in the spiritual metaphysical community and I am breaking rules in the money business community and here's the deal folks the place where money and business meets with spirituality and energetics meets with body that place right there that we've not been allowed to recognize or be in that place right there that's the sweet spot where money happens when you bring in business structure, money structure from business community, that's masculine money, and you bring in spirit world, metaphysics, energetics, um, all of that, that's feminine money, you bring that in and you plug that in, the EQ with the IQ, and then you integrate that with, through money coding in the body, you get all kinds of shift going on and healing going on so that the money can work better. That's what I'm doing here. That's what we're doing here breaking rules breaking with tradition breaking with taboo and putting the unthinkable together so that your money works better and you work better with your money and it all begins to come together all right so be sure to comment dm me and i would love to hear from you about how this is all resonating with you